Welcome to the second session of the IoT Summit. Uh, in this session, our focus would be on Sensor Things API successes around the world. OGC Sensor Things API has been adopted around the world and becoming the go to standard to build large scale and interoperable IoT systems of system. Uh, this session will showcase the successful use case around the world. Our first uh, speaker will be Dr. Jimmy Chow, who is the director and professor at uh, the FCU University in Taiwan. So welcome him. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Jimmy Chu. Uh, I'm the director in the uh, Fengjia University for the GIS Research Center. So I'm going to uh, make a presentation to you about the IoT platform for disaster resilience uh, in Taiwan for some of the things we did. Uh, oops. Yeah, just click on the slides. Very good. Okay, good. So, uh, as you can see, in Taiwan, there are lots of this kind of disaster. It happens every year. Okay, I try to wake you up. So, so this is a pretty good way to show how serious it, it, it is in Taiwan. We, we have this kind of typhoon every year, every year, almost every year, because we have very, very high precipitation amount, uh, even compared with the world's average. So it's three to five times about the uh, average precipitation in the world. So like, we, we have two nature disasters uh, in Taiwan. One is earthquake. This is how many earthquakes we have per year. Uh, don't doubt it, it's 44,000 per year. And every, and, and, and almost uh, among those 44,000, uh, almost in the average about 1,000 is higher than the richer scale 4.0 for 1,000. So which means if you visit Taiwan for a week or as a tourist, supposedly you should jump into probably 20 earthquake. So, so I think that's statistically, statistically. So this is how many earthquake we have per year and oops. I don't know where I'm in. Yeah, okay. And this is typhoon we have. Uh, each year we, we, we jump into about, uh, now only average about 10 to 12 typhoon each year. So typhoon uh, invade Taiwan. Oops. Okay. So, so we have the problem of uh, earthquake, we have the problem of typhoon. And this is why in Taiwan, the monitoring issue is one of the very, very important things. And all the different government agencies, they try to put their own sensors uh, in the upstream, in the middle stream, or in the urban area. Lots of different kinds of sensors to identify and also to send some kind of alert uh, and put some kind of threshold for each different kind of sensors. Uh, the way to integrate of all those kind of sensors in Taiwan in the recent years is through this kind of like sensor things API. So sensor things API, the standard has been already been adopted by Taiwan. Uh, for several years after it being released. Uh, so in Taiwan, for the monitoring, for integration, for interoperability, uh, there are lots of problems. I think it's the same thing in the world. For example, Forest Bureau are always in charge of, about uh, those lands above 1,000 meters, and Stormwater so Conservation Bureau in charge of 100 to 1,000 meters. Uh, it's their territory uh, authority in charge, and also the Water Resource Agency in charge of the river basin, and Central Geological Survey in charge of the landslide area. So that's four different ministries. So it belongs to different ministers. And it's really hard to have those ministers to, to make phone call every, every day and talk to each other. It's impossible. So the only way is through some kind of standard, through some kind of interoperability. Because in Taiwan, 
this kind of disaster, as I mentioned about the, the, the earthquake, uh, the typhoon, it happens every year. So each year we face this kind of problem. Uh, <clears throat> like 10 years ago, there was a very, very uh, severe, very deep landslide. It's uh, damaged the entire village and killed uh, more than 400 village people in the town. So, so the government, like after all this kind of lesson learned, we try to do everything to be connected from the upstream, from the middle stream, from the, from the urban area. For example, from very upstream, the Sun Water Conservation Bureau and Forest Bureau put a lot of different kind of sensors along Taiwan. Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is an island from like, here is the ocean side, up to here only about one, 100 kilometers. Then you jump into the peak is 4,000 meters. So from sea level zero, then a hundred kilometer, then that's a peak for four kilometer, that's a peak elevation. And then another probably 30 to, to 40 kilometer, then that's the ocean side again. So, so, you can, you, so you can tell like Taiwan has very steep land. So most of this kind of green area is either slope land or high mountain area. So in Taiwan, uh, we don't have so many sensors before, especially for rain gauge information. Uh, normally, like, like when I was a, uh, in the childhood, there are only information about the urban area because that's the only places uh, the government will be able to set up this kind of stations. It has very good power supply, has very good communication supply, and then they set up this kind of weather station. So, but not in the mountainside or in those kind of slope land. But now, because of this kind of Internet of Things, so in the recent years, uh, all these kind of government agencies, they try to build up their own sensors along the upstream and, and also the, the, the slow them area. Uh, so they're, they're like soil moisture, uh, like rain gauge, everything's automatically transmitted back through some kind of power supply and through some kind of, through some kind of uh, either power supply or some kind of like a communication supply. So, so in Taiwan, uh, we developed this kind of mobile vehicle for four-wheel four uh, drive trucks carry a kind of facility on the back and with with uh, generator, power generator, and also with satellite dish to use the satellite communication. Because in Taiwan, uh, during the typhoon season, there's a very, very high precipitation. The only communication uh, we'll be able to work out is through satellite communication. So that's the only that's the only way. So we have satellite, satellite dish uh, for the mobile system and also satellite dish on the permanent station. So all the information, all the sensors, send back all the information directly to some kind of uh, monitoring information center. And with all this kind of information, we'll be able to know what is happening in the in the in the site and what about uh, everything being changed for the real time. This is one of example, like this entire village is very close to this very, very high potential landslide area. And none of the village people would like to move out. In Taiwan, it's really hard to, to ask any village people to move out from their houses. So the only way the government will be able to do is to put a lot of sensors. Those kind of sensors include like the GPS, like the water level for the underground water, like the tilt information, uh, extension information, lots of these kind of things. All this kind of information can transmit back one millimeter or one centimeter changes on, on real time and also with the video. So everything will be able to, to feed back uh, to some kind of alerting system. So if there are any kind of movement along the potential landslide area, you will send a signal to the entire village people and ask them to go to the shelter, stay over there for a while. And after this incident, like after the rainfall or after something happened, then they can go back to their houses. So in Taiwan, we try to do this kind of things to broadcast all the sensory information. And the way to do that is also to connect with some kind of artificial intelligence. For example, if the, if the video found out there's something, something strange, it will go from green to yellow, then to red light. And we'll also double check the other sensor, for example, like the rainfall gauge, like the uh, velocity, like water level, to make sure it's not only one camera malfunction and saying, okay, something happened. So make sure like all, all, all the sensors 
all the sensors are already reflect the same thing, means something happened or something will happen pretty soon. So in Taiwan, uh, we tried very hard in the past several years, try to use the Internet of Things platform using some kind of architecture. So we, we try to establish some kind of dashboard and use the application and analyze lots of big data. And there are many, many different kinds of gateway. We use uh, MQTT and lots of sensor things, uh, API standards. And to receive all the devices, all the sensors information to go through here and then to, in the end, to go to the dashboard to be used. So this is one of the example we did. We have a, a public sensor web. So on, the, on this public sensor web, uh, anyone will be very easy to trigger or to register for any kind of sensors just in the public web. So like we use uh, just this RAN gauge and we can, we can uh, use the, the uh, specific identification for this RAN gauge. And as long as all the attribute data information just followed by the sensor things API, so we'll be able to use this kind of uh, very public platform to register. So in this platform, we already registered thousands of sensors in Taiwan, like the camera, like some other things. So every sensor can publish uh, the kind of sensor information by, by the sensor things API. So it's very easy to be connected. So this, this kind of platform enable lots of different uh, governmental agencies, lots of different sensors will be able to work on together, just follow uh, one platform. So after that, we have, for example, this is one uh, platform, especially for debris flow. So, so for debris flow information integration, we also connect lots of the sensors on the public sensor web using the sensor things API. So using that one, we'll be able to connect lots of different sensors regarding uh, any kind of information might be useful for any specific debris flow. So in each village, in each uh, wild creek, there are certain kind of threshold saying, okay, if this precipitation amount is over a certain amount, like over 300 millimeter, then that's mean you have to send out the alert. So for each wild creek, we set up different kind of threshold. So for, the, for those kind of threshold, then signal uh, all the village people through different kind of facility. So in Taiwan, uh, we talk about smart cities and we talk about how to use the Internet of Things and especially for disaster resilience uh, issues because in Taiwan, we're facing so many natural disaster every year. So we have to use a very good Internet of Things and try to make a very good smart city uh, application. For example, this is also one of the examples uh, in one of the uh, province in Taiwan. So this city build up lots of different kinds of sensors. Those kind of sensors either uh, along the river basin or even on the street to identify all the changes or the water depth like for this fresh, fresh floods information. So all this kind of information can be sent back to the managers. So the, the, the mayor or the managers will be able will be able to know what's happening outside and, and what is information and what's the real, real information regarding for this specific like rainfall event or typhoon event or even after some kind of earthquake event. So we'll be able to identify. This is one of the example we did. There are different kinds of sensors along the street like this one. This is the sensor to identify the what the thrust depth uh, on certain certain uh, periods. So it sent back all information using the solar power. So entire the entire port is there is some kind of like water uh, water depth uh, sensors here. So we know exactly like now is uh, uh, 15, 10 or, or, or 8 centimeter of the of the uh, flood's depth. But this is not the only one. We use virtue virtual meter. So this, this red line is not exist in the real world. It's only in, inside the virtual camera. So using this one, we'll be able to know what's the depth being merged inside the water. So we can double check about the real sensor, about the virtual uh, water meter. And another thing is the splash of the tire. For each car, the splash of the tire, and also we can identify what is the water depth here? 
So there's three kinds of information. For any kind of vehicle, we identify all the tires can splash about the water depth because of different color. And also we have virtual water meter and we have real sensor here. So everything we'll be able to identify can compare to each other. So in, in some of the province in Taiwan, where we set up this kind of sensors, uh, a, lot, a lot of this kind of sensor being set up in Taiwan, when we can compare with that, and we try to get uh, as, as many as this kind of images we can learn about. So this is something we're doing in Taiwan. So in the end, uh, in Taiwan, because we suffer about those kind of natural disasters each year, so all the governmental agencies, all the private or university, or even for the industry, we have to be more open, sharing, and have good communication because we need to know all the sensors being built by different governmental agencies or even private sectors, and also work everything together, make a good intelligence, then we can have very, very good services. So uh, in the end, I would like to show to you one of the film uh, we just did. This is only the draft one. I think it has it, it already been shown uh, yesterday in one of the uh, disaster resilient pilot. So we've been doing the kind of disaster, uh, disaster resilient uh, pilot. So, so this is only the draft one. So we try to, 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 to demonstrate how the governmental agencies work together using all this kind of information and using all this kind of sensors information, using different kinds of standards, especially by the OTC. Uh, sensor Things API is one of that. And we're, we're using lots of different kinds of standards. Taiwan is prone to typhoons and landslide disasters. Each year, we face three to four typhoons. The average annual rainfall is more than 2.5 meters, which is three times... These are the real, like this is just last year. One notable case was Captain Marvel, which happened in 2009. The rainfall reached 2.5 meters after 80 hours. That's the average yearly rainfall... Almost three meters of rainfall for down from the sky in four days. 9,100 people were evacuated. 1,046 escaped from the possible casualties. Unfortunately, 673 people could not be saved and pass away. If we want to prevent this kind of event, residents who live near the hazard areas, such as potential... So in Taiwan, all this kind of disaster information has to be published because uh, for all the village people, they really need, need this kind of information in real time. So, so, so all the village people, all, all this kind of disaster management, management, and this is all the sensors along the entire Taiwan. Taiwan Hill and Water Conservation This is one of the examples I just mentioned about. So there are so many different kinds of sensors along. So this is a platform just by the Sensor Things API standards. And so this is the example I just showed to you, the ring gauge. Cell phone has, has in Taiwan, everyone's cell, cell phone will be able to receive this kind of signal about the warning, about your alert. So we also adopt the geo package, routing, and geo SMS. Plus road obstructions information near real time. As for the residents on their own level internet environment, they can use offline geopathic routing along with GeoFMS to get a better evacuation route when disasters happen. By these means, the steps of the center. So, this is a FEMA platform we created for Sunwater Conservation Bureau regarding the debris flow monitoring. And also, with the historical image, historical. Uh, all the information. These can also help to better understand the geography of the land after the landslide and the flow have passed. 
which will further help for disaster management and mitigation in the future. Okay, so I think uh, this is uh, uh, the one uh, we just did for the for the disaster resilient uh, pilot. And thanks for a lot of different uh, assist, uh, either by OTC or by NASA and by lots of different institutes work together uh, to create this, this this film to explain uh, how the Taiwan government can use this kind of OTC standard, not only the Census Things API, but also lots of different kind of standard uh, to adopt as a disaster management, especially for sending the alert and sending the early warning information to those who really need this kind of information because we're facing this kind of natural disaster each year. So, so that's about my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. We have time for some questions. Oh. Is there any question? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, the limitation of the flow that uh, you told us that I think two parameters in order to detect the flaws in an image and yeah. a traffic camera. And one of them was that uh, you throw a usual Yeah, red meters, line. right, yeah. a gray one. And uh, uh, just, the red line, yeah. yeah. I just uh, wanted to know if you did it for every camera and you set it up for every camera in the city. We try, yes. We try to have every camera to learn about. Because, uh, so that's a deep learning because we have to have those kind of camera. Uh, so, so up so far is a fixed frame. It's a fixed frame. And, and also we have to identify one of, for example, that was a, a power pole. So put the virtual, uh, like the red lines as a virtual meters of the, about the uh, flood steps. So that's a virtual one. So we know, we know exactly to, because uh, if there's nothing happened, if it's dry land, then we know exactly exactly the, the entire the, the entire virtual uh, meters. But when it's floods, so we know like uh, on the bottom one is disappear is merge in, inside the water. So we try to do that for lots of different camera, but we have we still have to we still need to identify at this one of the target and power pole is one of the very very good one as a target. We have to ask the this this camera to learn about this is the virtual meter and that one is another virtual meter and that one is another. Hopefully in the future it will be able to smart enough to identify by itself, but not not this time. I, we still have to put this one inside the the camera and ask it to learn about. So it, it can identify. So we have three different kind of information. Just refer back. So we will be able to get a very, very good estimate or the real uh, uh, thrust depth. And also, uh, I think you mentioned that you used it in order to estimate the level of the flood by uh, these bar, these virtual bar in the images. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to know if you mentioned that uh, you used these parameters, these criteria, in order to estimate the level of the flood for example, oh, okay, it's <laughs> it's very hard to really simulate or estimate the depth of the fresh water. It's very hard in Taiwan. Every county has an associated university or some kind of private company to estimate or to say the prediction, saying okay during this 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 kind of amount of precipitation, uh, the entire city, uh, especially for the uh, district area might be serving to the water for like uh, 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter or in a rural area, it will be 20 meters of the, of the merge of the uh, flats. But none of that is accurate enough to do the real prediction because lots of things, the drainage, the slope, lots of things, the garbage, lots of things will have very, very uh, high impact for the water depth. So now we're still trying to learn, but yes, we try very hard, try to use some kind of good simulation model. So bad, hack rest, lots of, lots of this kind of simulation model, try to predict it in the future. But now we can only say, okay, but the prediction is this, this, this one, but the real is this one. So we still need to learn about, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Dr. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Hilke van der Stapp from uh, Fraunhofer, Germany. So welcome. <laughs> Yeah, that one. Okay. Um, let's see, we should be able to get it to see you in presentation mode. Slideshow. Yes, thank you all for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Hilke van der Schaaf. Oh, don't go automatically. Um, I work at Fraunhofer IOSB, which is a large uh, uh, a research institute in Germany. Um, we are an applied research institute. Um, that means we get uh, about 30% funding from the government and, and the rest we have to get by doing contract research um, from, with companies um, and uh, from European projects, things like that. Um, um, I'm also one of the implementers of one of the, of, uh, the main author of one of the implementations of Sensor Things, Frost. And as such, um, in about all our projects, we're currently using Sensor Things. And um, so I'll have an, I have a little overview of a few of those projects, um, starting with the city of Munich, München, as we say it in German. Um, the city of München, uh, Munich, of course, has a lot of uh, a lot of geo data, and um, it also has a lot of different. Um, different um, departments across the whole city. And part of these departments use the same data, part of them use different data. And synchronizing which department has which data and if it's, is it all up to date is a big hassle. So München wants to have an, a digital twin for the entire city. And they also want to enrich that with live sensor data. So they uh, started an, uh, a demonstrator to see if this is feasible and how to do it. Um, it's, the demonstrator is called Staffus. Staffus is actually this, this uh, road crossing here. Uh, and in, in this, this uh, demonstrator, they were wanted to combine uh, traffic um, volumes, um, weather data, and air quality data. So in the, they're, they're in, on this crossing, there's a uh, measurement station um, for air quality. They've got uh, counting loops in the in the roads to measure how many cars are going there. Um, and the weather data are, of course, coming from an external system. So they have their, their sensors. They're using node red to transfer their proprietary sensor output into um, a sensor things output that goes into a frost server or implementation of the sensor things API. And from there, it can be visualized in the geo portal or in Grafana for nice dashboards. Um, and it can also be used by, uh, in the future, by the entire public of, uh, of Munich, um, because they don't just want to make this uh, data available to their own um, departments. They also want the public at large to be able to, to use it. So here's an, uh, an overview of this, this road crossing with a lane model, which is typical static data, and that is then combined with um, live sensor data. Um, the demonstrator was working very well, so now they have to, uh, or they, now they can um, apply it to um, all traffic, all, all more crossings. These are all the crossings where they have traffic counting. And then in the future, they also want to um, combine it with uh, simulations to, for instance, make um, NO2 predictions uh, to see where the, the, the hotspots are in the city, because most European cities have an, uh, an air pollution problem as well. And um, yeah, so from the south of Germany, we go to the north of Germany, the city of Hamburg. Um, there, the agency for geo information and surveying also wants to have basically the same goals. They want to have uh, all, their, all their data. They have a lot of static data. They have a lot of dynamic data, and they want to make that available for everybody. So they want an, an urban data platform um, to um, enable an, a systems approach to internetwork and share and uh, the logical and analytical cap capabilities of the, the, the former data silos. Data used to be in silos, and you couldn't really combine it across silos. You want to make it uh, that you can combine all these different data types. 
Um, they want to do this using open standards, of course, because, well, if it's, you still have proprietary standards, it's still difficult to combine. And um, the sensor things API is there, a very important part for their, um, for their dynamic data. So, so far, they've uh, been working with um, traffic counting using infrared cameras. Um, they want, uh, what, one of the things they want to do in the future is um, at construction sites, use smart, um, smart traffic cones. So you can have um, live information of construction sites. Where is a construction site currently? So that you can use that for routing information. And they want to publish all the all their data through a single platform. Um, one of the pilots they've been doing so far is um, the, the real-time and historic data of the charging stations they have in Hamburg for your electric car. So you can quickly see well, where is uh, a station available or which station has been in use for a long time and might become available and um, things like that. And um, something they also want to do is, for instance, um, have real-time traffic light information. So you can see, well, the, the traffic light that's uh, up, uh, up ahead is currently red, but it'll turn green in 20, uh, 20 seconds. So if I slow down a bit, I don't have to actually stop. I can just roll on. Or um, it's currently green, but it'll be red in 20 seconds. So I might as well start slowing down already because I won't make the light anyway. Also, um, the, the it's... World Congress is, uh, will be in Hamburg in uh, 2021. So if you have an interest in uh, mobility, um, there's a good chance to uh, go to Hamburg. It's a very nice town, city. <laughs> Something completely different. Uh, Be Aware is a European uh, Horizon 2020 framework project that we've been involved in. And um, the topic of Be Aware is um, uh, disaster management, a bit like uh, the previous speaker in, in Taiwan. Um, this is uh, the goal is a generic um, framework for different types of disasters. So we have um, three use cases: uh, flood, flooding, um, heat waves, and uh, forest fires. Um, and the goal is, is to make information available to, to first responders and to uh, people in the uh, um, in the control centers. Um, both live data and um, forecasting data and simulation data. Um, so for the flood scenario, um, as a highlight out of that, uh, we, of course, uh, prediction data is very important. So we take uh, weather data um, and, and predicted rainfall data together with um, uh, the flow of the rivers and the sizes of the rivers. And you can make a prediction of well, how high is the river going to be. So here on the left is uh, in the Vicenza area near Venice. Uh, they have a, a lot of weather stations or uh, measurement stations. And um, they can combine the, the, the rainfall data, which is the green bar here, with, uh, with their known, uh, with the geological data, and uh, make a prediction of the, um, the water level, which is the predictions are the blue lines. So they regularly make new prediction when it's, uh, Getting, we're getting hot, the, the, the situation, or wet, almost. Um, they start doing prediction runs. Um, and then the, the brown line here is the real measured um, water volume in the, in the river. So here you can see it. It's, uh, the prediction was almost red. And, and red means wet. Um, in your feet, that's uh, not good. But it didn't, in, in reality, it didn't come quite as high. Um, yeah, and the sensor things uh, has, a, has really nice features to also store predictions. I mean, storing live, live data is, is really relatively easy. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a measurement and you have time with it. But as soon as you go into predictions, you'll, you basically need three times. Because, you know, you know, right now I make a prediction for what the water level will be tomorrow. Within about two hours, I will want to make a new prediction. So my prediction I make now will only be valid for about two hours. And the sensor things API or the, the, the data model behind the sensor things API, the ONM data model, actually um, supports that. So we've got a, a, a for every observation a phenomenon time, which is um, when will that phenomenon be there? So which is the water level, it will be tomorrow. Um, the result time is when did this value become available, which is now because I make the prediction now. And uh, how long do I want this valid, this prediction to be valid? Is for instance from now till in two hours. Um, because then I will want to make a new prediction because things might have changed. 
So that's one of the great things of the Sensor Things API. There's a very flexible data model. So yet another completely different project, um, another, another Horizon 2020 project, uh, Heracles. And Heracles deals with the protection of cultural heritage against climate change. Um, so there is lots of uh, cultural heritage in, in Europe, old buildings, um, but also la sites, uh, land sites. Um, and um, they might become endangered because of climate change, sea level rise, increasing rainfall, landslides, things like that. So these buildings need to be monitored. Um, and now I'm going to be very uh, brave and try a live demo, which is something you're never supposed to do during a presentation because it always goes wrong. Where's my browser? I'll just use this. Ah, oh, this one also works. Bigger. So one of the use cases um, is in uh, Gubbio. And uh, in Gubbio, they've got a really nice old palace. And um, Italy is also prone to earthquakes. Um, so this, this palace needs to be monitored. Um, and in this palace, there's also a nice, a nice uh, clock tower. Um, this system works on the, uh, based on an ontology. So this is uh, an ontology view. And in that ontology, we have also um, an uh, entity type called an asset endpoint. And those asset endpoints directly um, can link to sensor data. So in this building, to monitor it, they've got installed three accelerometers. They measure movement, um, acceleration. Um, and um, if the if the, such a building is usually always uh, moving a bit uh, because of um, tremors or traffic, and a building has an has has a, an, an inherent frequency, and when that frequency changes, you know there's damage somewhere. Um, so that's why they use accelerometers. And these accelerometers are um, pretty high frequency data. These are uh, 100 hertz sensors. And right here, we've got an overview of two years of 100 hertz, which means about 6 billion data points. Um, of course, here, we're not so showing 6 billion data points. Here, we're showing daily aggregates of these, these data. So if I, if I move my mouse over the line, you see that the time changes with days. Now, when I zoom in a bit, it'll automatically switch to hourly aggregates. And um, can zoom in a bit more on about one day. And then we switch to minute aggregates. And now I need to be around eight o'clock because of course the time here is local time, but the things are measured in Italy. So I have to be careful which time I select. <laughs> I want to be around eight o'clock um, I want to be around three o'clock local time. So I have to be more or less here. And I zoom on around eight o'clock. Now it might load a little bit long, slower. And then hopefully it works. Because now it actually loads half an hour of real data, which is about five megabytes. Um, come on. And the internet is either really slow or there's an issue. <laughs> That's why you never do a live presentation. Good thing I've got a slide of this. Because you would see that the bell struck three at three o'clock in the morning in the in the, at the day. Of course, it's not exactly at three o'clock because your Italians did not tell exactly. <laughs> no, I've heard it. It's a really old building and uh, it's an old clock. But um, you can see that um, you can also put high frequency data in a sensing server. And, and of course, in this case, uh, we've got the advantage that it's um, um, a really fixed frequency sensor. Um, so 
and, and you don't usually need a single data point for this. You need a free, you need a frequency, so you need at least like half an hour. So we're actually getting the data in, in half an hour. So we say, well, each observation is an um, is half an hour, uh, half an hour of data. So we say the phenomenon time is is uh, nice thing of Sensing's API. The, the, the phenomenon time is not just can does not have to be a single time. It can also be a time interval. So we can say, okay, the phenomenon time for this observation is from 10 to 10:30, and here is the array of data points that you need to map on that half an hour. And for the, the aggregates, there's the, the very useful thing is the multi-data streams, where you can say, well, this uh, observation has um, has three observed properties: the average, the minimum, and the maximum acceleration. Um, and then the phenomenon time for the daily aggregates, I say, okay, this this uh, this average goes from midnight to midnight, and the result is then these three values. And that way, you see it's an, 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 an aggregate. You can see exactly on, over what time this aggregate is valid, um, and you can usually, and since you usually need average, minimum, and maximum together, you can easily keep those together. Oh, my the time. Okay. Okay. And last project, um, yet another completely different thing. Um, BRGM, the, the French um, uh, geological survey, so to say, um, is not just doing geological things. They also maintain the, the water quality database for the entirety of France. So that's a database of about uh, 18 and a half thousand uh, measurement stations. Uh, they're measuring uh, something like 1,800 observed properties. That's chemical substances in water, chemical substances in soil, things like that. And um, in the last 40 years, I think, or 50 years, they've gathered about 136 million observations. And they wanted to know, can we put it in sensor things, or does that just blow up the system? And they also wanted it to be inspire aligned, which is the um, European directive for uh, publishing geodata. Um, and an interesting thing is there is that um, when collecting this data, you can imagine there's a guy going out in a rowing boat to the middle of the lake. He takes a water sample, grows back, uh, packages up, sends it to the lab, and the lab then measures on that one water sample like 1,500 different things. And you want to be able to correlate back, well, what thing was measured, but which samples, which observations were measured together. So after a bit of analysis, um, um, we ended up with, um, like I said, 136 million observations. They had about 10 million data streams and uh, yeah, 18,000 um, monolithic stations. The sensor in this case is often a, a lab procedure. And of course, observed properties are then chemical chemicals. A bit more details. Um, Interestingly, there are um, about 500 um, data streams per thing, which is on the high side for uh, sensor things, installation and things. But on average, only 14 observations per data stream, which is really low for sensor things. Usually, you have fewer data streams per thing and more observations per data stream. But when, when checking the performance, this works just fine. It's not really a problem. Also, when, for instance, saying, well, Give me all the feature of interests, features of interest that are for there for a certain thing. So you can easily do queries across all those observations, all those data streams, and link a feature of interest to a thing. So considering the time, I'll uh, end here. There are a few more projects in the slides. If you're interested, you can download the slides and have a look at them. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for you? Oh, and it did, did load. Uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's yeah, it lost. <laughs> Three rings. Questions? So thank you for the uh, like the overview of all these European projects. Just a question as context. Um, does each project select the standards that they want to use on their own, or is there like a general directive use or, or consider sensor things 
or are people just gravitating towards the same standards because they fit? Um, there is there is no um, directive that says that European Union projects have to use certain standards. No. Um, we are currently um, trying to get uh, censor things as accepted by the INSPIRE directive. So the INSPIRE directive that says how you're supposed to publish your data in the EU currently only has uh, SOS listed for censor data. And we're working on um, adding censor things to that. Um, but that only goes for, um, for governmental organizations that publish data. And um, all other projects, they, they can basically do what they want. Uh, but there is a, a very strong gravitation towards sensor things because for um, observational data, there is no, there are not that many standards available. Basically, it says SOS or sensor things, and um, then sensor things is the easier one to work with at the moment. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Alex Wan. He is an associate professor at uh, NCU Taiwan. He is also the co-editor of Sensor Things API Sensing Park. So let's welcome him. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Alec Huang, and uh, like what Tanya said, I was uh, one of the editor uh, for the uh, Sensor Things uh, API Part One. And <clears throat> so today I want to share with you uh, about this topic, uh, which is about one use case. Uh, uh, I only have uh, well, I'm going to uh, focus on only one use case, which is how to establish uh, like uh, uh, an uh, interoperable and open IoT infrastructure uh, in uh, for a nation actually. Uh, so uh, that's the topic over here. And so basically, uh, so in Taiwan, actually, we, uh, there are some design uh, about how to establish a smart home name. There are some uh, direction uh, to do it. Uh, for example, like the Taiwan uh, Executive uh, Yen, uh, they have uh, some a proposal of idea Taiwan 2020, and then uh, they have some uh, idea about how to establish the infrastructure or the, the cyber infrastructure uh, to uh, allow the data to uh, well uh, to allow the data to be open and share with uh, with, with all the agencies. And then <clears throat> one of the five uh, main focus uh, is the uh, smart home map. <clears throat> so over here, uh, they focus on, for example, like smart, uh, well, smart uh, disaster management and also smart uh, transportation and smart uh, city. So uh, basically, that's uh, one of the direction that uh, Taiwan is trying to, uh, well, uh, to go. And I believe uh, not only Taiwan, actually, many countries uh, they uh, they want to uh, support this type of uh, smart home and, uh, vision. And uh, fortunately, actually, uh, the current uh, government uh, in Taiwan, actually, they have one uh, big project, uh, which is called the Forward Looking uh, Infrastructure Development Program. And then uh, inside this big project, actually, there's a small part of it, uh, which is called Civil IoT Taiwan. Uh, I, if I remember it correctly, uh, the, fu uh, the funding for that uh, small project is about uh, 50 uh, five billion uh, no, well, Taiwanese dollar, uh, which is about 160 uh, million uh, US dollar. Uh, so that's about uh, the funding uh, size of it. So and so, what I'm going to share with you guys uh, is actually how we design, how we how we uh, try to design uh, this smart, uh, this uh, civil IoT Taiwan, and also how we uh, what's our progress uh, in the civil IoT Taiwan. So uh, I believe uh, well, everyone knows that uh, the, the, in order to achieve the smart, uh, smart home and vision, actually uh, IoT or Internet of Things is actually a very important uh, well, physical and also cyber uh, infrastructure. And according to a definition that's uh, from the uh, ITU, uh, the IoT is the global infrastructure uh, to interconnect the physical and virtual things and with interoperable ICT. So uh, why? Uh, what's the reason uh, that IoT is important for smart home run? Uh, because IoT uh, it provide two types, uh, two main types of capability. One is the sensing, and uh, the other one is tasking. So uh, for the sensing, actually, uh, well, uh, well, you can uh, like the keynotes uh, in the morning uh, speak. Uh, so. Uh, say, uh, if we want to understand, if we want to understand how everything uh, works uh, around our uh, environment, then we need to collect a lot of lots of uh, observations, uh, and especially from sensors. And if we can uh, merge them together, and then we can uh, use some AI technology or machine learning technology to build a model and even to, to predict uh, what will happen in the future. 
So uh, the sensing capability actually can help us to understand what's uh, happened in the past and what is happening now. And also we can build some model to predict what will happen uh, in the future. So, and the tasking capability actually can help us to have a more smart, uh, a smarter uh, applications. And in, uh, in uh, uh, well, uh, the meaning of smarter over here uh, could be more automatic or uh, more uh, efficient, uh, sustainable or produ uh, productive or secure. So that's what the tasking capability can provide us. And that will be a very important part of our smart home of course. So, and but however, uh, in order to uh, establish an open and interoperable IoT uh, infrastructure, the biggest problem is the heterogeneity issue. And I believe uh, everyone here uh, should, uh, re uh, well, should already heard about the term uh, IoT silos. And the, well, the, this is one of the, uh, you can say, but the opinion uh, article, uh, like uh, in 2014, actually, uh, one, uh, well, uh, they, uh, he, came, uh, he claimed that the IoT will never uh, come true. The vision of IoT will never come true, and the main reason is that uh, there are lots of uh, lots of big companies. Uh, they have their view uh, to the IoT uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure or in IoT industry, and uh, they are they, in those companies. They are powerful uh, enough uh, to create their own proprietary solution. And if uh, those big companies uh, they don't want to give up uh, their own uh, well, design and uh, to follow some certain open uh, open standard, then in that case you will have lots of IoT silos that cannot. Uh, uh, well, interconnect or communicate with each other. So that's the, well, you can say the IoT vision or how to, uh, the physical mesh application cannot be achieved. So that's the main problem that we face uh, at, for the IoT development. So in order to solve this problem, uh, actually, they are, uh, well, we, we actually recognize uh, there are two types of solution uh, to solve this IoT silo problem. One is using the hub solution. So uh, for example, like uh, Google, they have the Nest Hub. And next up, actually, they, they try to use those uh, connectors, or you can say, uh, so uh, uh, you, you can have a hub, and then it can connect to different types of IoT solutions according to their own proprietary uh, 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 proprietary protocols. And so that the hub can communicate with that. And most of the industrial uh, solutions uh, is is working on that that part because it's effective, and uh, it can uh, it can get things done uh, very uh, efficiently. But however, uh, that's, uh, that will have a lot of cost, uh, development cost, because the more uh, IoT products that, uh, follow, uh, that's, uh, that are following different proprietary uh, protocols, then you need to create more and more uh, connectors. So the more fundamental solution uh, to the IoT silo problem uh, is the uh, open standard solution. So uh, I believe, well, that's why actually we are here. So uh, in order to solve uh, these, these type of heterogeneity problem, uh, we need to uh, define standards. And not only define, uh, we, want, we need to promote uh, those, uh, well, uh, in, uh, internet, uh, well, those open standards. So and here, actually, uh, in Taiwan, we try to, uh, the, the IoT uh, infrastructure we want to establish is an open IoT infrastructure. Uh, so here is the general uh, view. Uh, and actually, it's a very, 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 very general view. So at the very uh, end, uh, very bottom, actually, we have lots of smart devices and sensors, actuators, and then uh, of course we need to have gateways over there. And then a device and gateway they can communicate uh, by using different types of by, by using different types of uh, local communication uh, protocols. For example, LoRaWAN, uh, those uh, low power WAN uh, solutions, or you can, uh, for example, LoRaWAN, MBIOT, Zigbee, or Bluetooth, those things. And then uh, by uh, through the uh, gateway, uh, those uh, IoT resources, sensing or tasking capabilities, they can uh, transmit it to the uh, web service label, and the web service label can uh, well help uh, well, can help the IoT infrastructure to uh, propagate uh, those uh, resources to the application uh, for different types of application. You can say. So, and uh, our vision is that this type of open IoT infrastructure and and the communication uh, between each labels, uh, they need to follow open standards. And they need to follow open standards. And currently uh, in Taiwan, uh, the, the developments in Taiwan, we are focusing on the uh, well, web service label. But however, the mo the, uh, in my personal opinion, the most uh, the heterogeneity uh, issue actually happens in the lower label, and that needs to be tackled uh, in the future. But however, right now, uh, we are trying to, uh, well, try to unify all the communication or, or, or unify all the data model and communication protocol uh, on the uh, web service label. Okay, so and here is our uh, well experience sharing. So uh, for the IoT infrastructure development in Taiwan, actually we, I divided into two activity. The first activity is actually the standard uh, and also regulation. 
And uh, so from 2014, actually, the, in Taiwan, the Ministry of uh, Interior uh, Information, uh, Information Center, they try to assess what are the possible uh, open standard solution that we can, uh, we can borrow or we can use uh, to be the most, the, the, the most uh, you can say, the, fund the, the foundation uh, for the IoT infrastructure in Taiwan. And so they try to uh, assess the international uh, IoT standards. And uh, in 2015, they select uh, the OGC uh, suite, the sensor web enablement. But at that time, actually, uh, the uh, sensing API was not well officially uh, published yet. So, uh, but so at that time, uh, we are actually using uh, the OGC suite, uh, but however, not the, including the, OG, uh, the the sensing API. Uh, but and so from uh, 2015, uh, we defined and promote uh, the what we called the sensor web common specification, and which. Uh, uh, set up uh, the rules of uh, well, sharing sensor data in Taiwan. So all the government agencies, uh, if they want to share uh, the sensor data uh, to the public, then they need to follow this type of specification. And then uh, in, uh, 2000, uh, well, in, in 2018, actually, uh, after the, uh, the sensing survey, uh, the first version of sensing survey has been published, then we try to include, we try to refine uh, the, the, census, uh, the sensor web common specification and to include the OGC sensing API and not only uh, include that and also include the uh, tasking capability as well. Okay, so that's uh, the first part and this is the OGC suite, I believe everyone knows it. And so basically there are some activity that we, 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 uh, we perform, uh, including uh, to define the common, uh, the common uh, specification and also we try to uh, do some uh, uh, service interpretation uh, to uh, tell the, all the government agencies that uh, if, you are if you follow uh, this type of standard, then uh, the data integration and uh, data uh, retrieval uh, can be very uh, well cost effective. And in order to convince other people to follow standard, uh, we also do some uh, course domain uh, applications. Uh, and online tutorial, of course, uh, to teach everyone about the standard and also uh, we have courses and forums. Okay, so this is the overall structure of our, uh, you can say, our standards. Uh, so at the top is one, uh, that's the, you can say, the foundation uh, to all the uh, sensor data transmission uh, in Taiwan, uh, which is the uh, sensor web common uh, specification that we have. And but however, this common uh, specification, they only define uh, the, you can say, the framework of uh, 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 the framework of uh, sharing uh, sensor data. It doesn't uh, talk about the specific domain, uh, how, how each domain uh, to uh, describe their uh, data uh, to, uh, in, in, under, the, uh, un, under the framework of the uh, OGC suite. So it's similar to uh, 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 the previous presentation, uh, which is uh, if you are focusing on different domain, uh, for example, like the accelerometer uh, or uh, like air quality or different, uh, different, different types of data, you actually need additional layer uh, to define what, how are you going to describe, how are you going to package those data in sensor sensor data. So uh, the second label uh, is the domain sensor observation standard and also the corresponding uh, domain sensor metadata standard. Okay. And the button is a label, which is the related standards and also the technical uh, report. So uh, this is a quick uh, summarize, uh, sum uh, summar summary of the, uh, our common specification. We, al uh, we already have two versions uh, and in 2015 and 2019. So basically the view, uh, the, the main goal is to unify the data model and communication protocol of sensor data sharing uh, in Taiwan uh, in, in order to uh, improve the interoperability of course. And then, okay, so basically uh, what we said in the uh, common uh, specification is that, well, if you are going to share sensor data in Taiwan, then uh, you need to follow the data, general data model and communication protocol uh, from the uh, OGC suite uh, standard. And the domain specific data model, uh, it should be defined and uh, it, should be, it should be designed and defined uh, by the main provider of the, that type of data. For example, if you are talking about the uh, air quality, uh, air quality data, then uh, uh, what uh, air quality data, then uh, uh, the main provider of the air quality data is the Central Weather Bureau uh, in Taiwan. And if you are talking about the water, uh, like water label, those uh, water resource data, then the main provider of those data in Taiwan will be the water the water resource agency. So the main provider should be the one uh, to design those uh, domain specific data model. And when they are designing those domain specific data model, they should also include the related uh, agencies and users uh, in the design uh, process. And those, of course, uh, th those domain uh, specific data model standard, uh, they need to be written and also announced uh, by the main providers. Okay, so these are the things uh, that, uh, well, okay, I will, 
Uh, so I will skip this one. Uh, basically, the main provider, they need to uh, analyze their domain uh, observation and they need to uh, define their domain data model and develop their uh, like or converter mechanism and host the standard-based uh, data service and then uh, register to a national uh, catalog service so that everyone can search for, that can search uh, those type of data. And yeah, I believe the, yeah, everyone should know these are uh, the sensing data, data model. And we actually also have some suggestion uh, to, uh, the, to the users and uh, to the agencies about how exactly they should uh, model their data uh, inside, uh, our, inside this data model. So I will actually skip this one uh, because uh, most of these are following the standard. All right, so just use some example. Uh, this is the air quality. Uh, so what we, uh, what we re kind of like require is that the thing, uh, each, each uh, sensing system or each sensor, each IoT device, you can say, uh, it's the, uh, it should be modeled as a thing. So this one uh, is an uh, uh, air quality monitoring station uh, in Dosha Auto. Uh, and then uh, the corresponding location, of course, you, can, uh, you need to describe it like that. And in this uh, well, thing, actually, they have a sensor, which is a PN 2.5N sensor. And this PN 2.5 sensor, you can monitor a certain phenomena, which is a PN 2.5. And uh, the feature of interest will be the theme's uh, location, well, or you can say the sensor's location over there. And the sensor can uh, can can count, uh, can observe uh, one, uh, can create one observation, and then uh, the result will be uh, like this at which uh, phenomenal time. And this type of data it will be packaged uh, by using a data stream of the thing. And that, uh, the data stream will be the PN 2.5 data stream, and with the unit of measurement, of course. And and link, the data stream will link uh, those other uh, entities uh, together. So that's the data model we design. And there's one other thing that I want to share with you guys, which is a little bit spatial. And this one is the earthquake. So we also try to uh, mon uh, well, model the earthquake data uh, in the sensing event. But however, uh, if we follow the uh, the previous view, so which is each station as a thing then it's actually not following what, uh, uh, what are those earthquake uh, scientists, they, 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 come, uh, they, they tend to use uh, usually. Uh, they actually tend to uh, view those uh, or share uh, those earthquake data like event by event uh, view. So, but in this case, we want to support, in this case, we want to support both view. One is uh, a station as a thing. This, uh, this type of view is similar to the, uh, the previous uh, view, which is uh, each thing. Uh, is the, uh, the the station the strong uh, motion uh, observation station, and then uh, you have a sensor which is the three axis uh, uh, accelerometer and monitor the three axis uh, acceleration, and you have the result like this at which uh, time periods actually, and then uh, so this is one of the view which is similar to the previous one, but however we also want to support the other view because in sensing data actually there is no uh, specific definition about what exactly should be the thing. So we also uh, model the earthquake as the earthquake event as a thing. Okay, so uh, the reason that we do that uh, is because uh, the earthquake actually has its own uh, properties. For example, where exactly that earthquake is and also what's the magnitude of that. And so they, they are some properties that you need to describe. And this is our way to do it, of course. Uh, they, well, we can discuss uh, whether this uh, is suitable or whether there are better ways to do it or not, but currently that's our way. So that means uh, the thing will be a certain earthquake event and then the location will be the uh, epicenter of the earthquake. And then each of the data stream will be, uh, will, will be from, uh, will, will, will be the, uh, the three, uh, the, the, the accelerometer uh, uh, acceleration actually uh, from different uh, stations. So uh, as you can see, this thing uh, it can link to different uh, data streams uh, that are generated from different uh, stations. And but however, because we already saw, uh, store those observations, those uh, well high frequency uh, well uh, acceleration data in the uh, in the previous view, so the observation over here actually is just a link to link back to the station as a thing uh, view. Okay, so that we don't need to store uh, the redundant data in the same service. Okay, so that's how we how we how we tackle it sure. so and here is an example about what the domain specific uh, web standard that uh, for example this is air quality uh, observation uh, standard so we need to define uh, for example if you are going to describe uh, like pn 2.5 and what exactly is the uh, you can say urn or uri uh, to de to describe it so that all the providers of air quality they can follow they can use the same syntax so if, for the user uh, it will be easier to integrate uh, those data together and correspondingly uh, we have the sen uh, sensor station 
uh, uh, standard. And this one is uh, you still using the sensor uh, sensor ML uh, as the well as the standard. Okay. So this is the online tutorial. And okay, so for the second part, actually, is the uh, infrastructure implementation. So previous one is about the standard and regulation definition, and the second part of it is the well actual uh, actual development. So like I said, uh, there's a big project uh, called the forward-looking infrastructure development, and then uh, in the mid uh, 2017, actually, we have a uh, with the, the civil IoT Taiwan uh, start well, start developing and start implementing. So in the current stage of the civil IoT Taiwan, there are four uh, focus. Uh, the air quality, earthquake, uh, disaster, and, uh, and water. And they are some small projects uh, working on that were uh, well, ongoing. And but however, what I want to share with you guys uh, is the data service platform. So the data service platform uh, is actually hosted by NCHC, uh, uh, the National Center for High Speed uh, Com uh, Computing. So uh, and so basically, uh, the, the, the data from the civil IoT Taiwan uh, it will be it will send to the uh, NCHC the data service platform uh, to man uh, for the management and <clears throat> some other uh, government data and non-government data will also feed into this uh, data service platform and those data uh, those uh, data are uh, feeding into that uh, it will be uh, well packaged as the census API service and uh, and shared with other people. <clears throat> And but however, beside that, actually the NCHC uh, infrastructure they also provide the computing uh, environment. So those, what the, the purpose of those computing environment is that uh, because there will be a lot of data in this uh, cloud, so uh, it's not so cost effective to download all the raw data for the analysis. So the view is that uh, if uh, they, they want to uh, have an ability to uh, for scientists or uh, industrial uh, companies, they upload their model. Uh, they upload their model to the uh, data service platform so that the computation will be in the same cloud. Uh, you, you are sending the computation, the processing to the data so that it will be more efficient. So, and of course, uh, the result uh, will be well uh, supported, uh, will be, well, will be uh, returned as a service or value added uh, services. Okay, so that's the architecture of the data service platform. So currently uh, we have, uh, uh, these are the data we have uh, standardized, you can say, uh, in the, uh, into the Census Things API services. And uh, so, for example, air quality, uh, we have some data from the Environmental Protection Agency and from some uh, uh, academic uh, syndicate or, uh, well, mini Ministry of Science and Technology. So from so in, the air quality data could be, the raw data could be from different uh, sources. But however, at the end, uh, they will be uh, modeled as, as the Census Things API uh, service. And earthquake as well, alert as well. Alert actually is not using sensing API, it's using the OSS uh, uh, cap, uh, the, I believe it's common alert protocol. Okay. And water resource as well. And actually uh, there are many, many other uh, water resource uh, data and currently we are working on, uh, but like water level, uh, uh, flood station, those data is already uh, packaged and uh, as the sensing API services and weather data as well. So these are the data services that we have uh, currently. And this is the, well, the front page of the data service platform. So if, and they are English version of, uh, uh, as well. So if you're interested, you can take a look. And we also put some uh, tutorial, uh, tutorial on the, uh, on the official website. And yeah, for example, uh, to basically to teach other people how to use uh, Sensing CPA. And some map, and also some map view of the uh, of the sensing by data, and also some time series data. Well, uh, the the code of time series data. So yeah, basically try to teach or try to uh, facilitate uh, the try to encourage people to use uh, sensing by service. And of course, and we have some examples about uh, the spatial query. And this is this one is actually using the sensing by uh, filter, the spatial query filter, uh, spatial. Yeah, spatial query uh, filter uh, uh, functionality of the supported by census and uh, you can package we also package the CCTV uh, data as well and oh and if you yeah if you describe uh, the for example like CT or some landmark uh, description you can query based on that as well and the final one uh, final example is the earthquake data so and because earthquake data is a three axis uh, 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 acceleration so uh, the, each, uh, in each of the observation result, actually it packages uh, those three uh, axes, X, Y, and Z. Okay. So this could be uh, the way you can show it. Right. And beside that, uh, actually in order to encourage uh, industrial companies and uh, users uh, to use those data, actually uh, 
uh, the government, uh, the Taiwan government, they uh, they host the data application context, and the price of uh, is actually pretty good. Uh, it's uh, three hundred, well, it's three million uh, NT dollar, uh, which will be how much? Ten. 100,000, okay, sorry. So 100,000 US dollar, okay. So yeah, it's not, not bad, okay. And for the first place, okay. So, and yeah, this is the second year uh, they, they host this uh, type of context. Oh, sorry. And finally, <coughs> no, I don't have time. Okay, so this actually, this part is actually, all right. I will very quickly uh, go over that. And this part is actually mainly, uh, is more suitable for the, uh, standard working group. Actually, there are some lessons uh, we have learned, and including, for example, like uh, having the properties uh, in the data stream that we have been discussed uh, yesterday, and how to put textual information uh, of the location that also has been uh, well, well discussed uh, yesterday, and also the uh, geojson uh, not supporting uh, like uh, other than let alone uh, coordinate system. Uh, then these are some of the problems that we faced. And the linkage between two different types of view and how to do that uh, for the event, uh, event as a thing or station as a thing view. And this is this one is also one of our uh, struggle, uh, one, one part that we struggle. And for example, uh, I, we believe actually this, uh, the better way could be using the semantic uh, web uh, links using, for example, JSON LD or uh, RDA. And yeah, I have personal uh, opinion about the since since we have part two, uh, how it can be could be uh, improved improved but uh what we uh, uh the problem uh, that we mainly uh, face is the willingness of data providers or related parties to support uh, this type of open standard because uh when we try to promote uh, this standard uh, to the agencies they say well our data is already opened it's online then why do we why why do we why do we need to change it to an open standard so that's the part we need to convince them so that's the main struggle, uh, the main part we struggle, and yeah, and also we believe in ontology or a dictionary organizing all the uh, defined terms or concept is necessary, uh, so that we can provide more uh, interpretability. Yeah, basically this is a summary. So Taiwan is trying to build uh, open and interpretable uh, IoT cyber infrastructure uh, with the sensors in the API, of course. And if we can integrate all the IoT resources, and then uh, we hopefully. I can help us to achieve a uh, well, more efficient and or more uh, educated uh, decision making and for the smartphone. Right? Okay, so, but we still have a long road uh, ahead. Okay, that will be it. Thank you, Andre. Any questions? Alex? No? Okay, thank you. Actually, I Okay, sorry. Um, The, uh, the concept of the weather event as the thing I think is, is pretty fascinating. I mean, um, could you, I mean, just really go into like how you how you came up with that and how could it be? Is there some way that it could be done differently, perhaps, with given the lessons that you learned mm -hmm. from doing it that way? Okay. So uh, the event, the event as a thing. Uh, this the, the the reason that we have this type of um, uh, thoughts is that uh, those events actually have some properties that needs to be well shared. For example, what's the epicenter? What's the magnitude of the earthquake? And also, uh, actually, uh, I also mentioned that the typhoon event. Uh, typhoon is also as it is also an event, and typhoon as a thing is. Still, uh, it's actually still required because Typhoon is it has its own trajectory. And then when how how to uh, link the Typhoon event to the, for example, like a rain gauge uh, data, so that say okay, so this period of time, uh, the, this period of the uh, uh, rainfall the rainfall data could be from this observation, uh, could be from this Typhoon event. So. In the past, like uh, like I mentioned uh, yesterday, the, in the past, this type of uh, linkage, uh, we we think the, this could be achieved by using semantic, uh, by using a semantic relationship, and it could be like additional label uh, to on top of the uh, sensing API. But however, if if we do that, then there are other things we need to define about, for example, what's the relationship, and then that is not 
an open standard yet, or that it's not open standard. So if we want to do this as a national uh, standard way to share the sensor, sensor data, then we think, okay, so we probably need to compromise to just using, purely using the sensing CPI to model it. Then at the time, the only choice uh, I can think of is, well, use event as a thing and then to link them together uh, by using some uh, hyperlinks. So that's the reason uh, we uh, designed it like that. Just an, another um, maybe comment or a question on that. Um, did you consider using um, the weather event as a feature of interest here? Because then you would have like a that, that's that's what you're trying to monitor, mm -hmm. and you have the sampling features then, which are the different stations all over, right? Yeah. So uh, yes, actually we 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 think of, well, we thought of it, uh, but however, at the end we think. Uh, Actually, I, I, I totally agree. This is that, 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 that's one way to do it. And then uh, at that time that there's a debate, uh, say how, if we are going to use the event as a feature uh, or not. But however, we think that the, the feature, uh, there's not much uh, defined properties inside it. So it can be like very free form. Uh, then in that case, it's difficult to be queried. Uh, because well, you can uh, you can uh, different. Uh, of of course, you can say okay, the, those domain specific uh, standard can define it. Then I agree. I also I also agree with that. But at the end, somehow we just think well, using thing as the as event as a thing is it, it kind of like uh, fits more with the Internet of Things uh, concept. So that's what we eventually uh, well, eventually that's how how, how we design. But I totally agree that could be one way to do it. Okay, thank you, Alex. Our final speaker of this session is Dr. Sarah Saidi. She is the Assistant Director of Geosensor Web Lab at the University of Calgary. Let's welcome her. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Sarah Saidi. And today I'm going to share you some um, secrets and recipes about uh, our, uh, how we implemented a successfully and effectively some solutions for use cases in Alberta, Canada for some IoT applications. So this is our GeoWeb Sensor Lab team. And I'm pretty sure you have met most of them here. Uh, the director of the lab is Dr. Steve Leung. And uh, we are all working together um, in different directions. Uh, we took, we uh, basically can uh, divide our lab's direction of research into um, IoT, data management, uh, tasking and analysis, and 3D simulation and modeling, which is more concerned about syn syn synthetic environments, CDB and uh, 3D uh, environment. And uh, basically we are working with anything from uh, geospatial anything related to geospatial sensors, data, analytics, and insights. So for example, anything uh, regarding 3D visualizations, uh, GIS, uh, spatial temporal analytics, sensors from ground, uh, remote sensing, uh, drones, citizen sensing, uh, mobile and wearables, and also uh, different uh, scales of data, uh, all the issues uh, related to performance and interoperability of data, and insights about uh, different insights we can get from the data from smart cities, environmental monitoring, oil and gas, and 3D simulation model. Um, our lab is uh, quite well known for uh, OGC Sensor Things API. And um, uh, Steve Liang, the director of lab, is uh, kind of uh, considered as the father of the um, Sensor Things API, and we are continuing uh, to collaborate and contribute to Sensor Thing uh, standard and uh, test suites, and like as grow as growing with new students and older members. And uh, basically, as um, all uh, discussed before, um, the the main issue is interoperability in um, IoT, and we are going to use uh, Sensor Things API to facilitate and uh, improve um, 
different IT solutions and uh, implement reliable um, platforms for scientific applications that I'm going to show you three of them in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first uh, use case is um, the use case that we're currently working on. It's a OGC Skira pilot project. Uh, it's, a, it's a pilot project about a smart city interoperability, uh, interoperability reference architecture pilot uh, for public safety and uh, it's, um, uh, I put it at this diagram from um, the Skira um, uh, project. And as you can see, um, the purpose of Eskira is to advance uh, the interoperable standards for a smart, uh, safe city. You can uh, see it has different uh, stakeholders, um, different apps and different data uh, storages. All came together into cloud and uh, some uh, sensor hubs and some um, actually um, hubs are, are going to provide some uh, real-time information to the platform and we are actually uh, our project is a small part here traffic sensors which is about real-time uh, traffic sensing and uh, so I, I will talk about our uh, contribution uh, to Skira. Uh, the, in Skira uh, they're going to integrate um, IoT sensors into a common uh, platform for public safety at the community level and uh, our challenge is basically um, using um, this uh, unit, which is a, using a deep learning as a sensor. And uh, yes, this is a Jetson Nano board and a Raspberry Pi camera attached to it. And this Jetson Nano board, which is recently um, very popular and released from NVIDIA, and uh, it's um, a powerful GPU uh, board in compared to Raspberry Pi, which was previously used for most of the edge computing. And we are going to explore its capabilities for real time uh, um, monitoring of traffic. So this is an intersection in Banff, and this is uh, kind of like part of the uh, um, model that we trained uh, for uh, this uh, sensor and this um, board. And you can see that AI as a set of deep learning algorithms in this project uh, fundamentally change traffic monitoring. It means that if you can see cars, um, pedestrians in daytime or in fog, rain and, and uh, snow situations, so the, the uh, smart sensor or a deep, uh, the uh, sensor that we're working on can uh, detect them as well. And in real time, we ca it can give us a perspective of the intersection a uh, number of cars, pedestrians, traffic signs, closures, and uh, our challenges to detect a uh, flood uh, for this uh, project. Uh, this is the architecture of the system. So we have a CCTV network. Uh, we have the Raspberry uh, uh, Pi camera, and also other source of uh, cameras from city. And we are going to use uh, different libraries, OpenCV, um, YOLO, uh, and deep learning, uh, libraries to detect cars, number of cars, speed, uh, closures, and uh, other things. And then we can send them, we can uh, deploy this library, uh, deep learning library into the sensor, into this board, uh, which is a powerful board, and also into the server. So uh, for um, like uh, processing the other cameras API information. And then um, another dashboard will be designed by the other groups to uh, connect to our outputs. Uh, the other project is called Pomelo. Uh, Pomelo is a, pro a portable methane leak uh, observatory detection for emissions. And um, as uh, some of you might know, the federal uh, regulations uh, for methane is going to be enforced uh, in Canada uh, from uh, 1st of January, 2020. So most of the oil and gas industry companies uh, have to uh, regularly inspect their oil and gas facilities and uh, the business as usual methods are there and um, actually um, are effective for uh, leak detection, but they're so time consuming and expensive, especially if they're going to do it for hundreds and thousands of oil and gas facilities and a couple of times a year. So uh, we are doing, uh, uh, we are developing a methane sensing system that provides actionable insight to identify and measure um, and also to reduce uh, the 
the emissions uh, more cost effectively. So as you can see, uh, all those facilities need, need to be um, inspected from the uh, drilling um, to production and processing and uh, pipelines. And here you can see that based on the measurements from the sensors, you can detect the, poly the, uh, the methane plume and how it's uh, actually expanding. So this is uh, the uh, system uh, on uh, a vehicle. So we have GNSS, an anemometer for uh, wind direction and methane sensor. And these sensors are all um, uh, already there. And this system is, uh, has been uh, field tested and selected for participation in different um, uh, challenges uh, for methane uh, measurement and uh, also supports on and off path survey. So you can also do those uh, traditional methods. So you can drive to the uh, oil and gas facility, do your inspection, and then uh, a team of um, um, like traditional serving for methane can go and take pictures by the, uh, those um, uh, cameras that can detect uh, methane and also can measure uh, like off path and connect to the system. Also, uh, we are going uh, to support opportunistic sensing by developing this system on a fleet of uh, cars and vehicles uh, uh, that can go across the oil and gas sectors and kind of like do it as a um, citizen sensing system or basically for uh, work um, vehicles. They can have this system in a larger scale. So scale was one of our uh, scalability was one of our challenges in this project. Uh, so as you can see, this is the architecture for the system. Basically, we are going to collect the data and uh, the observations are available in for uh, scientists and uh, oil and gas industry to uh, monitor their uh, facilities. And also we are going to um, use it um, uh, like in combination with some models to measure uh, the methane uh, uh, that is leaked from uh, different facilities. The last project I'm going to talk about is Vera. Vera is, a, um, Vera is about boreal ecosystem recovery and assessment. The, uh, the problem in this uh, project is that the boreal forest area uh, is under increasing pressure from human development related to natural resource extraction. It means oil and gas companies use uh, those seismic lines uh, that cut the uh, trees for explorations. And these seismic lines become uh, the um, highways for wolves to um, hunt caribou. And as a result, the population of caribou is going down. And that's one, one important problem in uh, Alberta. Also, uh, oil and gas companies, if they wanted to return those lands to the crown, they need to grow back the trees and reclaim those lines that they made for explorations. So they need to demonstrate that uh, this, uh, the environmental um, and uh, the environmental um, the environment of those lines and the um, other forest area are the same, and they can grow back those trees. So uh, in this project, we wanted we wanted to monitor uh, the environmental uh, parameters of those lines, and uh, this is another system uh, that is. Uh, like under $50 uh, dollars that, uh, that has um, temperature, uh, humidity, light sensors. Uh, also, we added um, a PM uh, 2.5 at some point to also measure for air quality. And this is a, a small uh, affordable board. And actually the most um, expensive part was the case, which was about less than 100 bucks, but um, yes, 100 bucks. Ten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and then um, we designed a network for sensing across the se uh, seismic lines and forestry areas. And this is the architecture of the system. Uh, again, we use Sensor Things API as a tool to facilitate our work for interoperable um, and efficient way of uh, implementing this project. So um, uh, this is the um, dashboard developed based on that and uh, the codes are freely available and um, also the dashboard is available online on github uh, the other project is still under um, the dashboard is on development so as the summary and discussion i put four uh, 
uh, challenges that we have in our lab, which we are working on for the next steps. And uh, the first one is, uh, can we have a pervasive sensing vision? Can we have it realistically? Uh, we almost there. We have the technology. We uh, try to um, have the framework, a reliable, scalable framework for research projects and our scientific purposes. Uh, we demonstrated an end-to-end -end system that can be set up very quickly uh, thanks to sensor things API and with low cost. It's possible to use open source hard hardware and software to build environments for sensing uh, system that really works. And also um, modern IoT cloud infrastructures such as AWS IoT offers a scalable foundation for our projects. But is it, uh, uh, is it still um, challenges uh, about that, yes, we are working on those challenges in our lab about scalability, security, extensibility, and interoperability. Those are the challenges that we are still uh, working on, and uh, we are going to use different um, designs, different hardwares, different sensors to uh, add values to our systems to make them uh, more survivable and also um, over more reliable networks. The second challenge is are real-time uh, insights um, necessary? So how we can extract them from the data? Um, how, um, is it possible to extract them? Can we have them or really uh, how, how, how we can uh, improve them, improve their accuracy? For example, in the case of uh, deep learning as a sensor, how we can improve uh, the accuracy of our model, how we can improve the efficiency of co our computations for traffic monitoring, methane monitoring, or microclimate, and also, how about the other application that we can incorporate to the previous ones? The third challenge is how we can integrate AI, as um, Dr. Steven, uh, his presentation this morning mentioned, how we can integrate AI into IoT and create added values to our uh, products and uh, frameworks. And uh, we have different challenges with this one. So uh, what are statistically meaningful as a temporal and uh, spatial patterns? What are the uh, prediction, uh, how well we can um, have a prediction model to dynamically fits to data and variation of the uh, dynamic data to detect anomalies may, and uh, detect um, any inconsistency. And also what are the useful sensors and data that can provide better insights uh, for AI? And what are the base uh, data sampling or spatial temporal um, resolution for pattern recognition? And the fourth one is, Institute sensing. So if, for example, you get to pick, um, th I, I'm going to put this challenge as, a, as an open uh, challenge for you guys to think about and propose three observed property to monitor, uh, to, uh, monitor with IoT sensors that can be useful for a lab that, that we can expand our next project based on that. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any question, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions for her? So any application just came to your mind for Alberta or Langas? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Thanks for joining us for this session. Uh, let's have a coffee break and then we will be back with our, step, uh, with our next session, which is IoT connectivity and digital transformation. Thanks. <laughs>